Hi. Welcome to this lecture on Athenian black figure vase paintings of the mid 6th century BC. It's the second in the series on vase painting and attribution. While the purpose of the first video was to explain how attribution works, this current lecture aims instead to solidify this information by introducing you to a few of the most prominent painters of the mature period of black figure. That is, the period around the middle of the 6th century BC. We will be taking a deeper dive into their artistic personalities. For each of the painters we examine, we ask the question, what about their styles defines them? What stylistic features distinguish their works from their, uh, the works of their contemporaries? In seeking an answer, we will be looking at examples of their work, carefully identifying where possible elements of these characteristic stylistic features. The period that we are most interested in is the middle of the 6th century BC, roughly from about 560 to about 530 BC. This is the period in which black figure flourished and is the period in which we see the standard themes and um, scenes from mythology and their respective compositions develop into maturity. You have been provided with a lot of material on um, the website. I will assume in this lecture that you have read the PDF on Black Figure. I will assume also that you have watched the first video in the series. If you haven't, I urge you to please stop watching this video and watch the other video first and read the chapter, the PDF, on Athenian black figure vase paintings first, and then come back to this video. For those of you who have watched the first video and read the PDF on the chronology of Athenian black figure vase painting, um, we can move on. I first would like to just mention a couple of books that will be very useful to you in this lecture. The first is Sir John Boardman's classic book on vase painting called Athenian Black Figure Vase Painters. It's available at archive.org. Search for it there. Particularly, read chapter four called The Mid-Century and After. The second book that is very useful, but which you don't really have to worry about too much. If you can get a copy, great. If not, don't worry, but you should be aware of this book because it is the classic in this area and that is Sir John Beasley's own explorations of the origins of black figure entitled The Development of Athenian Black Figure. Uh, the re revised edition was from 1986 so if you can get hold of that great but really it is Sir John Borden's uh, classic that we will be using um, particularly chapter four. Uh, I have based the lecture quite closely on that particular book. The second thing I want to say before we start is just a little bit about the images that we use. There are certain legal constraints that we have to abide by, and one of these concerns copyright on images. That means that we can't simply take pictures we've seen on the internet uh, um, for, or from various museums and just put them in our video lecture. For this reason, we have mostly used images from the New York Metropolitan Museum's open access program. These are public domain images. Uh, you can have a look at them yourself. There's a URL on the slide, and I would urge you to please just go and have a look. They're, most of the New York Metropolitan Museum's collection has images available in this format. It's not limited to Greek and Roman material. It is a huge collection of art, one of the best collections in the world. And the images are almost all public domain. So briefly, what will we be doing in this lecture? We will look at three painters in depth. These are the masters of Athenian black figure of the mature period, the period around the middle of the sixth century BC. There's a little bit about each of these three in the PDF on the chronology of Athenian black figure. 
So you should know these names already. There's Lydos, the Amazis painter, and Exekius. In addition to this, we will briefly look at two groups of painters that are very seldom mentioned in articles on Athenian black figure vase paintings, but which I think, or whom I think, are quite important, or quite interesting at least, because they represent the not so good. There's a tendency in classical archaeology for people to try and base their understanding on the conventions of the period by looking at the best examples. In other areas of, of archaeology, this is considered to be not ideal. Instead, um, in other areas of archaeology, it is considered that to find out what the ordinary people think, you need to look at what was distributed widely, what was consumed by the masses. For this reason, we'll be looking at um, two groups which have a prolific output. The other pot painters and the mannerists. I'll explain what those mean a little bit later. Before we get cracking with the meat of this lecture, a couple of points. The focus in this particular lecture is practical. We want you to get a feel for how one looks at stylistic features and how one attributes vases. Um, we are mostly interested not in your being able to do this like a professional, because this is an introductory course. Um, and this is a very specialized area of archaeology. Instead, we want you to be able to justify your attributions by referring to specific features of the style that you see. So if you are, for example, in an assignment, given an image of a vase painting and you're asked to identify the painter, we're not most interested in whether you get the attribution correctly. Uh, because, frankly, this is a contentious issue anyway. As you will know, if you've read um, the material on the Vickers Gill hypothesis. Now, instead, what we want you to do is to be able to justify your attribution. That is where you will get most of your marks from. The first painter we look at is actually quite difficult to describe in terms of his style. But in most discussions of the black figure period from the middle of the 6th century BC, Lydus is first, in part because he's probably the earliest of these um, masters of the middle of the 6th century BC. So we'll deal with him first, but rest assured, the other painters we deal with in this video lecture will be a lot easier to describe in terms of their style. But to give you a bit of background first, the two vases are signed Ha Ludos as the painter. Now Ha Ludos is Greek for the Lydian. So essentially you have the Lydian painted me or something to that effect inscribed on two vases. The, f the, the fact is though that the style of the painting is clearly Athenian. So we don't know who this person, the Lydian, is. We don't know if he actually comes from Lydia or whether his parents were Lydian. But nevertheless, that is how he signs. And from that, we constructed the personality um, of Lydos, from the Greek word, word ludos, meaning Lydia. Now, one of the reasons Lydos' style is so difficult to describe succinctly is because he, he is at the center of a larger group that varies quite a bit in quality. While the work that we are sure is Lydos is actually very fine, some of the other work is not quite as good in terms of its precision of detail, etc. And there's a gray area there. We don't know whether this is by Lydos or one of his many followers. And so that's one of the reasons that it's difficult to get to grips with precisely what Lydos' style is. 
The other problem is that Lydus paints for a long time. In fact, his earliest vases are dedicated to animals, much like the earlier Corinthian style and very much like the vase painters of the first quarter of the 6th century and the beginning of the, sixth, uh, the second quarter of the 6th century. Painters such as Sophilos, the Gorgon painter, and Nearchus, and in fact some of Lydus's earlier stuff reminds us of Nearchus. In fact, Lydus also paints cyanocups, which places his earlier stuff firmly in that period between 570 and 560 BC. But the style actually continues for a long time. And um, you can see the style changes with the period. So the later work seems to be influenced by, or perhaps influ influences, the painters of that time, like Ezekius and the Amazus painter. Furthermore, the same style, so the style associated with the Lydian, or with Lydos, decorates a cup made by Nicosthenes. Nicosthenes is a potter who works during the red figure period. So we've got a style that spans from the end of those large vases with uh, painted, decorated entirely by animals, all the way to a potter, to a vase that's uh, a painting that decorates a vase made by a red figure potter. So that is a long period of time. So that's a brief introduction to Lydos, um, the painter. He's difficult to pin down. The, there is, seems to be a broad group of, of paintings in a similar style, some clearly by the Lydian, the person who signs as Ho Ludos, but some of them imitators or perhaps people working closely with him, his colleagues, um, people working in the same workshop. We really don't know. But what we do know is that this distinctive style of Linus and the style um, of the painters around him continues for a long period of time, possibly as long as 40 years. Okay, And it, it's not clear that all of these are by the same person. To describe Lydus' style, possibly the best thing to do is to look at some examples and from the examples extrapolate some broader principles. We have a beautiful vase here from the New York Metropolitan Museum. The scene depicts dancing satyrs and maenads with Dionysus in the middle. Let me just quickly identify these figures for you. You can see Dionysus in the middle with the drinking horn. Now, Dionysus often appears in this kind of scene, um, sometimes with a woman looking at him. Um, he always carries some kind of drinking uh, vessel. The earliest vases have a horn, a drinking horn, and later vases have a cantharos, um, or even a kylix, if you don't know what those terms mean, read the material that you're provided with on Athenian black figure vase paint. Now we can see that in this particular image, which is roughly from about 550, maybe 540 BC, he has a drinking horn, but the style is a little bit you know, is, is, is a little bit later. It's, it's not one of Lydus' earliest vases. The style is quite similar to vases from slap bang in the middle of the 6th century BC. The person just behind uh, Dionysus, on the left of Dionysus, is a Maenad. 
My nans were female followers of Dionysus. In vases, they're often seen dancing together with satyrs, satyrs being the um, very hairy, wild, beast-like uh, men with equine features. And you see a, a number of them in this vase as well. A couple of things I want to point out about the Maenads. Um, the first is, notice the skin, the animal skin that the Maenad is wearing. But the second is that her skin here is black. Now you know that most of the um, Athenian black figure vase paintings, in most of the vase paintings, the skin of women is white. We usually use the term that flesh, the painted flesh of the female figures is white. I can assure you that originally this particular female figure would have had white flesh, but the white clay has flaked off. You can see the foot of one of the other Maenads, um, and you can see clearly there there's white clay. So the females are actually white skinned in this particular vase. So don't um, be tempted to think that black skin on the females is part of Lydus' style. It really isn't. The figure just to the right of Dionysus is an example of a satyr. And I'm going to close in on this particular satyr now so that we can look at some elements of Lydus' style um, that characterize his satyrs. There are three things I want to point out about Lydus' satyrs. The first is the hair on the body is produced with a stippling effect using incisions that are just little single strokes. You can see quite a number of them on this particular um, satyr within the circle on the slide. You can see some of those little single strokes that are used to indicate the hair, the shaggy hair of the satyr. The other thing is the penis of the satyr is not erect. Satyrs normally in these Dionysian scenes have erect penises um, and they're usually quite large. Erect penises, the technical term we use is iffy phallic and when they're large the technical term is macro phallic. Now satyrs generally have erect Penises. They are ithyphallic. But Lydus' satyrs often don't. Not all the time, but very often Lydus' satyrs unusually um, have flaccid penises. Now, think about what they're doing here. They're followers of Dionysus, who is a god of excess. Um, and so it, it, it is natural that in this. Um, ecstatic dance of the Maenads and the Satyrs that they would actually be ithyphallic. But in addition, it, these lewd beasts um, are actually exhibitionists normally. And this brings me to the third point about Lydus's Satyrs. They aren't very animated. And they're actually quite subdued. This is not limited to Lydus' satyrs, but actually many of Lydus' figures are quite subdued in their poses. They're upright, they don't move much, not a lot of gesticulation, their arms don't do a lot of things. We'll see how different that is with some other painters um, later on in the lecture. But these satyrs are not particularly animated. And that's quite unusual given that this is really an ecstatic dance they're supposed to be doing. So to have a satyr standing there in such a demure pose is actually quite unusual and is typical of Lydus, but not of other black figure vase painters. Um, so we've looked at the satyr 
And we're going to contrast that later with the satyrs of the Amazus painter, who are far more animated. But let me move to another type of vase, another scene that actually is associated with Lydos and his followers. And that is the horseman amphora, where you really have, it's quite simple, you have a man on a horse, occasionally with another figure there. Uh, the person on the horse often has a mantle around its shoulders, hanging down, maybe carrying a spear or something like that. Um, and the scene is quite highly stylized. This theme occurs on a couple of vases in the middle of the 6th century uh, BC, but it also occurs in another painter that's not generally associated with Lydus, called the Princeton painter, one of the painters we'll see later on, in that when I discuss the Princeton painter, I will compare it, um, him uh, with this particular slide as well, this particular vase as well. You can see that the style here is actually not that far from the style of Nearchus, whom I mentioned earlier. I would like you to please use your own sense here to compare this vase with a very similar vase by Nearchus. For copyright reasons, we can't show this vase, but I'd like you to compare the upright, almost formal stance of the figures and compare the intricate work on the horse's mane. Um, so you can see the difference between Lydus and Nearchus and also the similarities between Lydus and Nearchus. And I'll leave that as an exercise to you. I've given you the link here to an image on the BZ archive, so you can just follow that link and compare these two vases. The vase that we have in the slide by Lydos and the vase by Nearchus. I'm also going to show you a vase by one of Lydos' followers. This is a, um, a large group, as I've mentioned, we often say the manner of Lydos, to say that it's close to Lydos, but we don't think it's actually Lydos. Rem remember the Vickers Gill um, controversy? Um, we, don't, we don't really know who these people were, and many times when we attribute vases, please remember that we're doing so based on our own artistic sensibilities and our own understanding of how artists express their unique style. There's a lot of room for error on our part. So when we use the term manner of Lydus, we're really saying it's probably not Lydus. It looks a lot like him. It may be his follower, but we're not ruling out the possibility that it is actually Lydus. So uh, it, it is, however, nice to compare these two because you can see that the vase that is in the manner of Lydus, and that is the vase on the right, is nowhere near as fine in terms of the incised detail, but even in terms of the composition, the proportion specifically, it is quite lazy by comparison. Notice that the vase on the left, which is a hydra, and a hydra has, um, this is an, artis, uh, um, an articulated hydra, which is a hydra where the neck is made separately from the rest of the vase. And um, so that generally has a shoulder with its own design on it. But you can see that the composition here is very pleasing. There, there are very few figures. They're quite balanced in terms of where they're placed on the, um, on the, the uh, uh, background. And there's some harmony between the painting on the, the, the belly and the figures dancing on the shoulder. The Proportions of the human figures and the horses are also quite formal. Their stances are very upright. They are not particularly animated, but a lot of care has been taken in the rendering of these figures. Contrast that with the image on the right, in which you've got quite a slapdash approach. The legs are too skinny. The body is too big of the horse. Look how the rider slumps in his, um, in, in his uh, um, 
seat there, his, his posture, his leaning back with his shoulders, uh, um, you know, with his head leaning forward from his shoulders. The horse's head is reared, even though it, it is otherwise static. You know, if the horse pulls its head back like that, it's usually, you know, it, it, it's, it's tending to be trying to move backwards. That's not what his, the effect he's trying to go for. The horse in all of these amphorae is meant to be moving forward. But um, this one almost gives you the impression that it's, it's about to raise its forelegs. So, you know, not as much care, but you also get the sense that the image on the right, the vase on the right, which we have styled the manner of Lydus, is probably by a less competent artist, I would say. Now on to the next image where I will show you a counterexample to some of the things we have said about Lydus' satis, which illustrates the difficulty sometimes of defining Lydus' style using, you know, sort of absolute criteria. Something that in certain cases we will be able to do with the Amazis painting. Um, now, here we have a fragmentary vase, and in fact, a lot of the examples I give you from now on for all the painters will actually be fragmentary. There will be a number of fragments. Fragments are nice because they allow you to focus on the details. Um, and I'll show you some examples of that. First, just survey the, all of the little shards that comprise this large fragment. Um, you can see that the scene, I mean, it's quite difficult if you aren't used to, to uh, looking at vases, but this is also a scene that involves satyrs, because you can see some of them. But is it Dionysus and satyrs? Well, it's very different from the composition we saw earlier, which had Dionysus in the middle and then dancing women and men, monads and satyrs. Instead, we've got a horse in the middle and we've got a figure that doesn't look like Dionysus and is carrying an axe. The scene is actually the return of Hephaestus. And if you aren't aware of the scene, you may want to just hit pause and go and look it up on Wikipedia or wherever. It doesn't, it, it's not important for the understanding of this, of this vase and what's interesting of, of this vase, but you may want to uh, um, uh, look at the story of the return of Hephaestus in your own time. But let's look at some of the details here um, because we're actually interested in the style. And here we have an example of um, the bottom part of a satyr on one of the fragments, sorry, on one of the shards in this large fragment. Linus has moved away from the single tick for the fur and instead he's got double ticks that look a little bit like exclamation marks. Double incisions that he uses to indicate the hairy fur of the satyr. Look at the detail on the vase that the satyr is holding. Now you can see that um, the this, this satyr is holding a vase there. It's actually called, this particular kind of vase is called a volute crater. And you should know about this from your you, from uh, the the reading material. If not, I mean you 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 can you can look at that in your own time. But we've got a really beautiful example of a volute crater here, and it has been decorated uh, with a lot of care and detail. What I'd really like you to take notice of, though, is that the satyr is still not ephephalic. But in addition, he's kind of microphallic, isn't he? Um, very small, non-erect penis. He's also fairly subdued. Um, there's not a lot of movement uh, in his body. He's just picking up this volute crater, this very large volute crater, um, which would seem to be um, on the floor. We can compare this with the satyr we saw earlier on 
the first vase of lattices that we looked at. And you can see that in terms of their pose, in terms of their movement, they're fairly similar. But also note though that the, the difference in the way the stippling has been used to uh, illustrate the fur on the, on the setter. But finally, in this fragment, so the last thing I want to show you in this fragment, on another shard in the fragment, is a satyr that is actually ethyphallic. And this is fairly unusual for Lydus, an ethyphallic satyr. But notice that although he is ethyphallic, the satyr isn't dancing. All right? he's, he's, he, he doesn't have a lot of movement at all. Um, you know, he, he, his hands, his arms gesture in a way that that suggests perhaps he is doing a little bit of dancing, but he's like a very nervous uncle at a wedding, um, dancing demurely in the corner. He's certainly not the gregarious exhibitionist satyr that we normally expect from uh, satyrs, who, I must stress again, are sort of <laughs> at, the, at, at the, the border of man and beast. They are like men, but are bestial in nature. So they're usually exhibitionist, gregarious, um, fornicate a lot, but not Lydus' satyrs. Lydus' satyr here is upright. Uh, with, although he is ethyphallic, he's not in any way doing, engaging um, in a manner that would, in other circumstances, seem inappropriate. Finally, then, I just want to look at something that uh, was painted on a different kind of surface. This is also by Lydus. Um, it is painted on a plate, on, on the inside of a plate. And so the person doesn't have the same kind of surface. You know, the, the vase is curved in two directions. You paint on its belly, typically, the the, the main scene is on the belly. The belly is curved around horizontally, but it also curves vertically. Plate, the uh, center of the plate is flat. And this gives, a, um, this gives a, a, a surface that is far more similar to the tondo, the inside of a drinking vessel. And so you have a slightly diff different style being used. Notice the incisions are quite thick by comparison, in part because the figure is slightly smaller than the figures on the big amphora, because this is a plate, a smaller object, but it's not miniature. Notice the, how he renders his, the, um, the mantle that is hanging from the man's shoulder. It's normal in the middle of the sixth century to show this using bands on the torso of the figure. Um, as you see on the image to the right. But this beautiful way of indicating it um, with this arc um, to show the mantle folded around the torso is unusual, but it's not unique to Lydus. But it is the mark of a person who takes care over the way they render their figures, but perhaps is not as intricate and detailed as the two painters we're going to look at just uh, uh, next. That is Amazus or the Amazus painter, and after that, Exequius, considered to be the greatest by many, considered to be the greatest of the vase figure, um, black figure vase painters. Now, while Lydus was quite difficult to define in terms of his style, the next painter we look at, the Amazus painter, is actually quite distinctive by comparison. Now, first just a little bit about his name. We have some vases that are signed by a potter called Amazus. The thing is, the style on those pots is quite distinctive. So 
we think that they are they are made they are painted sorry by the same person now what we find is that the pottery itself is also quite distinctive and it turns out the distinctive painting appears almost always together with the distinctive shape, the distinctive pottery. Now, if we take those signatures of the potter, of Amazus being the name of the potter, we, we, it seems that whenever Amazus pots, or most of the time Amazus pots, the person who paints it is the same. It's, it's the same person. Now, this could mean that they've there's a potter and a painter who work closely together, or it could mean that Amazus is both a potter and a painter. We don't know which of these is true. So to be safe, we make a distinction between Amazus and the Amazus painter. Amazus being the potter, i.e. the person who actually makes the vase, and Amazus painter being the painter. That is the person who actually decorates the vase. Now, you will hear some people interchangeably use Amazus and the Amazus painter for the person who paints. It's difficult not to. Technically, it's correct to say Amazus painter for the painter and Amazus for the potter. So let's go straight into the features of his style. First of all, there's a little bit of mannerism. And what do I mean by mannerism? Well, we're going to have a little section on man mannerism right at the end of this um, of this uh, video lecture. But briefly, I'll show you some mannerism on the next slides. It's a style with exaggerated gestures and proportions. Um, now, the two examples that you see here are by the effector that's the name of the painter, and the man of the elbows art painter. And you can see they have these exaggerated gestures, odd proportions on the bodies of the, of the people. Now, bear in mind that the faces don't really give away much expression in Athenian vase painting. It's the gestures that give away the expressions. So we are actually seeing some exaggerated um, emoting going on in these paintings. Now, that's mannerism in a nutshell. The Amazus painter has some elements of this in his style. So those two vases that I showed you are not by the Amazus painter, but there are some elements of that kind of exaggerated style in some of the later works of the Amazus painter. And indeed, some people feel that um, the at least one of the mannerists is possibly Amazus's successor or the Amazus painter's successor. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, other features of Amazus' style, or the Amazus painter's style, to be more uh, precise. His satyrs, unlike the subdued satyrs of Lydus, the Amazus painter's satyrs are often lewd, ithyphallic, meaning they have erect penises, and macrophallic, they have large penises. But also, they're just a little bit more expressive. And expressive satyrs have nothing to be concerned about because they should be. They're the attendants of Dionysus, the god of revelry and wine, etc. So it's not surprising to see your beast like satyrs behaving badly. And Amazus's behaves a little bit worse than Lydus's satyrs. Sticking with satyrs, the stippling on the satyrs of, of Amazus, or the Amazus painter, is quite typical. It's not too far from that of Lydus, but where Lydus favoured a single stroke incision to indicate the stippling for the hair of the satyr, the Amazus painter tends to have two little strokes. Now as we've seen, some of Lydus's satyrs also have that, so it can be difficult to tell them apart, but they don't look similar. So as always, I'm going to say, find some images and compare for yourself so you can get a feeling as well as just what I tell you, you know, so you don't need to rely just on the very distinctive features that I tell you. You also get a feeling for these different painters. 
Um, sometimes the satyr's proportions and shapes are also similar to those of Lydus's. What we do start seeing is in the middle and later work of the Amaz's painter, we start seeing a lot of detail creeping into his, his works. Now those common features of his style are features that are that you see in other people's style as well. The Amazus painter on some, not all, but on some of his vases does some things that are almost unique, that allow you to immediately recognize uh, a painting as being his. First of all, in the later vases, the flesh of the women is sometimes outlined in dilute glaze, that is, or, or in glaze, in, 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 in black. And in those cases, the flesh of the vase is, the, sorry, the flesh of the woman is not white, as is the normal convention in vase painting. Instead, it's left in the original red color of the clay. And if you'll remember back, we call that original red color of the clay reserved. So what the Mars's painter's woman sometime look, sometimes look like in his later works is uh, a woman outlined in dark paint, but with their flesh reserved rather than painted in white. And that's very interesting because it's almost unique amongst black figure of that period. And it seems to be foreshadowing the red figure. Um, if you don't know what I mean by red figure and black figure, please pause this video and read the relevant parts of the, of the source material, the course material that we've put online for you. Um, so outlined women's flesh, and I'll show you examples of that just now. We are going to see examples of all of this. Another thing that Amazus likes is he loves shield devices. Now, while most painters paint shield devices, shield devices just means when there's a shield that is painted, um, the shield device is whatever emblem is blazoned onto the shield. Okay. And the Amazus painter, um, he loves shield devices. His shield devices often have a lot of color and they are often incised. Whereas most painters prefer to paint only. The Amazus painter will often incite his uh, shield devices and that allows him to get a lot of detail in those shield devices. Sometimes the Amazus um, uses color in unusual ways. For example, he even has a red-faced Athena on one of his paintings. So that's something that is not, uh, um, is not common outside of the Amazus painter's work. And also, he sometimes omits the little line at the bottom of um, the painting that the figures rest on, called the ground line. And he sometimes leaves that out. So, so these are features of his style that are almost unique to him. Those are very distinctive. And let's see a couple of examples now. Um, we have a satyr here. And a couple of things I'd like you to notice about the satyr. Um, first of all, the stippling. Notice that it's rendered with the two little incisions, not the single incision that Lydus likes. The second thing I'd like you no to notice is the satyr is iphiphallic. Okay. So you'll, you'll, you will notice that in this little fragment here, in this little shard, you'll notice there's a woman on the left. It's a minad, so I mean, there's no surprise there, but notice her flesh is not white. It is reserved and notice that it is outlined. Okay, so that is immediate giveaway, the analysis painter. So let's move on to another shard. Again, this, this shard, by the way, is from the same painting, okay? So it's the same vase. It's a different shard from the same vase. Okay, here we've got Dionysus on the left. You can see he is facing um, the right. 
you can see his beard, you can see the locks of hair that would have fallen behind his head, and what we call forelocks, the locks that fall on the other side of his ear. Now, um, he, this is something quite, um, let's just say, quite common in a Marsus painter's work. He likes locks. A lot of other paper, uh, painters use locks as well, but the Amazas painter is particularly fond of these locks of hair, and he's very fond of forelocks, um, which are not that common, but they are very common in the Amazas painter's work. A lot of his figures have forelocks. Um, there is a woman looking at Dionysus, a woman on the right, and she is again painted in outline, and her flesh is reserved, not white. The woman um, has a couple of other features that are common to the Amazas painter's work, not unique by any means, but they are common to the, in the Amazas painter's work. He likes little trinkets and little accessories, such as jewellery. Notice this woman has an earring, but she also has a necklet. Um, so that is something that the Amazas painter likes, and we see all of that in this particular fragment. Let's move on to yet another vase by the Amazas painter. Here we see him, um, he, he has decorated a cup. Notice that despite the small size of the cup, okay, he's, he's painting in a slightly different style because he's got to adapt his style for the for the small space that he has. A cup is much smaller than an amphora. But look at the shield. On that shield you have a lamb, or a ram, sorry, I should, I should say, a ram, incised. I mean, it's beautiful detail, but it's also incised. And remember what we said, the Amazas painter loves his detailed shield devices, but he also does something uncommon in black figure, and that is he incises them. And even on this little vase, I'm sorry, yeah, this little vase, it's a cup, he has incised the ram on the hoplite's shield. Here's some more of the Marsus painter's fragments. In this one, we see his use of color, his animals, uh, it's just a, an, an animal there. That, the Amazas painter likes to incise the hips with some arcs, right? And then between the arcs, he often puts a little bit of colour. It's not unique to the Amazas painter's work by any means, but it is something he likes. In this shard, far more interesting is the fact that there is no ground line. And that is something that is very uncommon outside of the work of the Amazas painter. Um, and finally, I want to show you one last vase of the Amazas painter, and this is some of his later, uh, middle and later work. And you remember I said that he, um, he looks almost mannerist in some of his later works, exaggerated gestures. And here's, here's, here's an example of this. Figure's quite upright, except for the figure in the middle. But look at the figure in the middle anyway. He shouldn't be upright in the first place. He is putting on his shin pads, his greaves, we call them. Um, he's putting these on. If you were to try and put shin pads on in that stance, you would topple over. The gesture, the pose, is exaggerated. Notice the, the um, outstretched arm of the man just behind, i.e. to the left, of the, the figure who is arming himself. An exaggerated gesture there. I would like you to look at the Amazas painter's work. It's very easy available, so you can find lots of examples. Remember, we can't put every picture we see on the internet in our PowerPoint presentations because there's copyright uh, restrictions, but you can look at many of the uh, images of the Amazas painter, and for yourself, compare with the works of some of the mannerists, like the Effector, particularly. We'll see 
a bit more about the mannerists later on. But for a moment, I'd just like you to remember these few things about the Mars's painter's work. Some of the things that are very typical of his style. First of all, we've got um, women's flesh outlined in some of his later works and left reserved rather than white. We have, um, unlike Lydos, we have very charismatic satyrs. His stippling effect is rendered with two uh, two vertical incisions around the, the, the skin of the, the satyr to indicate the fur. His satyrs tend to be macrophallic and ithyphallic. We find he really likes details, particularly in things like shield devices, but also in the accessories like, um, like jewellery. And about that, um, the shield devices, he tends to incise his shield devices, where it's more common amongst other painters for the shield devices to just be painted. Okay, And finally, on that point, have a look at the shield device on this vase, because he's used colour to great effect here. But what's interesting is it is both painted, the red is painted on, and incised. The details on that ball are incised. Now, the next painter we're going to look at is considered to be one of the, if not the greatest vase painter, um, and his name was Exekius. We've already dealt with Exekius to a small extent in the previous video lecture on vase painters. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, just a couple of the things that we, we, we should say about him, perhaps by way of a recap. And remember, a lot of this information is in Boardman, so please use Boardman um, to refresh your memory or read through Boardman beforehand, and a lot of what we say will make more sense. So first of all, Exekis is considered to be closely related to a group of artists that have similar style and whose, pot whose pottery has a similar shape. We call that group of artists Group E. Um, group E may well have been where Exekius started, but he supersedes them in every imaginable way. He's a much better painter, a much better potter. Uh, he, yeah, he, he is really, truly exceptional. Um, <clears throat> he quite likely painted some vases that were made by some of the potters who worked in Group E. And he probably made some vases that were painted by um, some of the painters in Group E. Now, an important thing about Exekius is that he is both a potter and a painter. Now, remember in the case of the Amazas paint, we weren't sure if potter and painter were the same person. But in the case of Exekius, we know because Exekius often signs. Exekius made and painted me or Exekius made me and painted me. Um, and here we, we can have no doubt then that he is the potter and also the painter in those cases. But what we find is when we can, when a vase looks very much as though it was potted by Exekius, the surface also seems to be painted by Exekius, has the same style. So he probably painted and potted his own his own works, apart from the few examples in Group E, where maybe Exekius was a potter, and in some cases where Exekius was a painter for a Group E vase. Now, what makes Exekius different from other vase painters? Well, he's considered by many people to be the greatest of the black figure vase painters. He's considered by many to be different in terms of how exceptional he was. Um, one of the things that he has that is quite different from any other artist is his exceptional sense of balance and his use of negative space, which is not something that black figure artists before him did. After him, well, some do copy um, this technique of his, but before him, they don't. Typically, what you have before Exekius is vase painters trying to 
put as many figures as they can, usually six figures um, in a, uh, a painting. Quite often, two figures on either sides of something that's happening in the middle of the vase painting. And you can go back and, and have a look at some of the examples we've shown, and you'll see that if it's not a procession, there's usually something happening in the middle, and then either one or two people on either side framing the scene. Now, Ezekiel doesn't always do that. Ezekiel introduces something new. He has in some of his vases, and, and by no means at all, but in some of his vases, he'll have only a few characters. And the characters are positioned in such a way that you, it draws attention to, it forces you to look at the action that's going on, making the story somewhat more poignant or um, giving it more impact than it would otherwise have had. Um, now, something else about Ezekiel, we know that the Amazas painter and Lydos could um, incise very fine detail. So Ezekiel's detail is arguably finer but that in itself is not unique. However, Ezekiel does seem to strive for realism more closely than his contemporaries, even Amazus and Andalus. So let's look at some examples and we'll try and see whether we can spot these characteristics in these examples. The first one I want to show you is a beautiful figure of a warrior surrounded by two pages, probably, his, his attendants. Um, we know from inscriptions, in many cases, that the person in the middle is Memnon, um, the Ethiopian prince. And so we've got two attendants with him. This is not an uncommon scene in Athenian black figure vase painting. What is uncommon is for you to see the black African physiognomy rendered with such interest and to some degree precision. And when I say precision, it's something that would have been quite outstanding to the Greeks about black African physiognomy, sub-Saharan African physiognomy, is the curliness of the hair would be very different from the curliness of a European person's hair. You know, the Greeks, there would have been Greeks who were quite dark-skinned and curly-haired, but not like this. And he is drawing attention to this. Ezekiel draws attention to this. If you were to take this vase in person and rub your hand over its surface, you would find that the little dots that he has used to indicate the curls of the attendant's hair are actually raised up from the surface of the vase, something that is almost unique in Athenian black figure vase painting. And that's because he is striving to faithfully, as faithfully as his medium will allow, reproduce the thing that he has seen. And I think quite obvious here, he has seen a sub-Saharan African person. Um, which has allowed him, perhaps from memory, or maybe had a model we don't know, but it allows him to reproduce this with such faithfulness. Um, so the next vase, though, shows us the other aspect of uh, Ezekiel's style that I mentioned earlier, and that is his fine detail coupled with his use of negative space and balance in terms of the overall composition. Now, you do remember um, I said that your typical pattern for the composition of a, a scene on a vase is to have two figures on either side looking. We call them bystanders or onlookers. <coughs> Excuse me. And in the middle, um, we'll have the scene that everybody's interested in. On this vase, you have something very different. There are no bystanders. And the thing that is going on in the middle takes up most of the space. Now, some scholars have noticed that on each side, there is something that is taking the place of a bystander, but it's not a human. It's the shields of the two warriors in the middle. 
Now, these two warriors are, in fact, Achilles on the left and Ajax on the right, and they are playing dice. Notice a couple of things. First of all, despite most of the bars being empty space, we're still drawn towards the action in the middle. Notice their eyes pointing directly, looking directly at the, the board. Notice that attention is drawn towards the board, not only by their eyes looking at it, but by their hands. So the most movement that there is are the hands. You're invited to see the hands moving on the board. And the spears, which parallel the direction their eyes would likely be looking straight towards their hands on the board. Okay, so these are, are, are actually devices that we use in composition of paintings today, since the Renaissance um, onwards. We've used these devices um, and tricks, and Exekis is using them two and a half thousand years ago. It is quite remarkable. Um, I'd like you to look closely at the detail on their cloaks. An absolutely fantastic detail. Uh, almost feels as though there is volume to their cloaks. In other words, you can almost feel that, that it's something that you could touch. It's, it's almost um, um, 3D in a sense. I mean, it's not obviously, it's on a flat surface. But um, the curvature that he's drawn into it and the way he renders the, um, the details, and the patterns on the cloaks suggests that he's trying to give this impression of its volume. Um, something else I'd like you to notice about Ezekiel's painting here is the writing. As we'll see later on, it is not universal to see that the writing actually makes sense in Greek. Take my word for it, this writing does. Other, many other artists do write, but in many cases, it's not clear that they're literate. Ezekiel clearly is, but not only is he illiterate, he, the writing is actually quite neat by the standards of Athenian black figure. Now I'm going to give you a close-up here of the heads of a bunch of different painters. We've already seen Lydus and Amazus, and I've shown you the satyr um, of Lydus um, earlier in the presentation, and um, in the middle, at the bottom, you've, you've seen this image of uh, from the Amazus painter. It's the image where the um, it's the central figure of the soldier putting on his greaves, which you can look at um, if you wish. And on the left, we we have Exekius, um, and this is the image of Ajax in the painting that we've just looked at, the vase painting we've just looked at. And you can see the difference in the amount of detail. The hair is finer than the hair on the Amazus painter's um, example. The curls of the locks at the forehead are also more elaborate than you typically see in the Amazus painter and on Lydus' um, work. But what I really think is interesting here is the ear, because the ear looks as though he has actually tried to reproduce the actual parts of a human ear and not simply gone for something, for, for some effect, rendering effect that does the job. Con contrast that with the Amazus painter's example where you can see it's a human ear, but it doesn't look quite like an anatomically correct human ear, which is quite different from Exekius's, because Exekius's ear actually does mimic the anatomical features of a real human ear. So again, this is Exekius's striving for realism. The Spring Painter, on the other hand, he's not even in the same league. Spring Painter is quite happy to that you just recognize it's a human face. He doesn't put any more effort into that than um, you will need. So um, yeah, I, 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 you know, to, to finish off on Exekius, I'd just like to draw your attention to a couple of things in this final vase because I think it brings together some 
uh, some of the things we've been saying about Exekius. This is the image of Achilles killing Penthesilea in the Trojan War. Penthesilea was the queen of the Amazons, and Achilles was the greatest of the Greek warriors. And the Amazons fought as mercenaries on the side of the Trojans in the Trojan War. You don't need to know all that, but I'm just giving you some background to the story. They are, t uh, um, they are sources that say that Achilles fell in love with Penthesilea as he was about to kill her. This is a marvellous example of Exekius's style of introducing very few figures to draw attention to the poignancy of the scene that is depicting, in this case, the death of Penthesilea. Compare this with the image we saw before of Achilles and Ajax playing dice. What's different here is there aren't any things, any shields or humans or anything like that framing the scene at all. So all you have are the figures of Achilles and Penthesilea. Notice the sharp contrast of the white flesh of the female warrior with the black flesh of the male warrior killing her. Notice the difference in the textures. The male warrior has a very simple outfit, a breastplate and a short tunic, whereas Penthesilea has the animal skin. You've seen animal skin before on the paintings of Lydus and Neomarsus painter, it's what Minads wear, but compare that with the elaborate detail of this panther skin that is being worn by Penthesilea. But notice too the gaze between the two. She is turning back and looking at him. It's common on vase paintings, but you don't usually see it between a female and a male warrior. She looks back at him, and the fact that their eyes are meeting is accentuated by the line of Achilles' spear going straight into her throat. And we can, you know, in many ways, we, we can reproduce this moment by looking at it. You know, he's captured a lot of the emotion um, that... that one could convey in this particular scene. So you, you've, you've got a little bit more about Exekius in the previous um, video, so you can have a look at that if you, if you wish. You've got Boardman. But to just sum up Exekius, there's just four things that really make him stand out. That is, his compositions can be unique. He has some ordinary uh, um, compositions as well, but a few of them, such as this one, and such as Achilles and Ajax playing, uh, um, playing dice, have incredible uh, depth of composition. His details are exceptionally fine. Um, the way he incises details are exceptionally fine, but also they tend to strive for realism. He is exceptionally neat. And this comes across not only his paintings, but also on the writings on the vases themselves. Now, next, we're going to go from the best of the vase painters, the finest quality uh, paintings, to the more ordinary painters. And we'll be looking at what Beasley called the other pot painters. The next section is on what Beasley referred to as the other pot painters. Now, when he says other pot painters, he's being a little bit dismissive. Boardman considers this to be an area for the connoisseur. And what he means by that depends on how you interpret connoisseur. It has two possible meanings. In art history, there's a technical meaning for connoisseur, and that means that a, a connoisseur is a a scholar who's primarily interested in matters of attribution and matters of style, right? So they're not really interested in, in the development of a particular kind of painting uh, or themes 
or even really personalities. They're interested in style, in the manner in which people um, or, or individual artists render um, particular features of the painting, such as anatomy, etc. Okay, so that's a, a connoisseur, a person who's primarily interested in style in paintings, in, 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 in painters' individual styles. But connoisseur can also mean something a little bit more informal, and that is a person with refined tastes. And it implies, in the context of Boardman's quote, someone who is very knowledgeable about Lars' paintings. And why I bring this up is because it explains what Boardman thinks about these other pot painters. He, he thinks that these are um, painters that the average person wouldn't care about because they don't say enough about art history. And he thinks the people who would be interested in this area are people who are either so passionate about vase paintings that they're interested in minor painters, or um, that they're, they're of interest to people who are specifically concerned with style, because there's something interesting about the style of these other pot painters, but in terms of any of the grander themes, they are actually pretty drab and maybe unimaginative. But I, I think differently about them, and I'll explain that just now. But first, I just want to point out that Beasley says um, about this group, remember, other pot painters is simply a name Beasley gives to this group of painters. Um, Beasley says about them, you know, that you may want to skip this chapter. And if you're really interested, you can come back to it after you've read the rest of his book. Okay. So, <laughs> the reason why Boardman, Beasley, and pretty much every scholar of that generation is so dismissive of the other pop painters is because their quality isn't that good. The, none of them have the eye for detail of Exekius. There aren't any fantastic compositions that are really, really poignant. Um, there, there are no real, really new, innovative compositions or, or themes, subjects that anybody bothers to copy. Right? So there are some things in these other pot painters that are pretty unusual, but nobody copies them. So that they're not influential, in other words. And I think that's why people tend to dismiss this group of other pot painters. I, however, um, see it differently. I think that these painters truly tell us something about the development of Athenian black figure. Um, I don't think that someone like Exekius, who is an exception rather than the rule, is really the best person to tell us what Athenian pottery is like. After all, very few people would have been exposed to his pottery because it is so good and probably very expensive. Most people instead would be exposed to the pottery of and the paintings of lesser artists. And I think understanding who th uh, consumed these pots is a better way of understanding Greek culture of the sixth century than to understand the geniuses like Exekius. So having said that, let me just tell you a bit about some of the personalities here. You've already come across them in the first video because we did a lot about the style of these painters. Two in particular, the Princeton painter and many of the groups in, uh, uh, many of the painters in this group of other pot painters seem to be related to the Princeton painter in some way. And then there's the swing painter. And I mentioned the swing painter as well. Some people thought he was the Princeton painter's protege. And then there's the painter of Berlin, 1686, probably the oldest of the painters in this group. Again, he seems to work during the later part of his career closely, at least his style is closely related to that of a Princeton painter and the swing painter. All three of these, the thing that characterizes them is 
um, and in the case of the painter of Berlin 1686, I'm talking about his later work, they seem to use a shorthand to render effective results using minimal te uh, technical skill or effort. Why? Maybe they lacked the skill, but I'll show you examples of the Princeton painter's work where it doesn't look as though he's lacking in technical skill. But another reason might be because they're trying to get the output done quickly. In fact, the, prince, um, the swing painter has left one of the largest um, extant outputs. Now, to some degree, this is just a matter of charts, what has survived. But we've also got to remember that what has survived does, to a large extent, also represent how much was output at any particular time. Okay, it's one of the factors of survival is just how much of the stuff was actually out there. And a lot of full vases by the, prince, by the swing painter um, have survived and we, 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 we have them. So it's quite possible, it's quite plausible that his output was actually quite vast. Um, and so maybe the motive is economic. If you can draw a vase, draw something acceptable very quickly, it's much, much easier than spending the time and effort on the painstaking detail of someone like an Exekius. Now, think of it e in economic terms. If you have the skill of Exekius, perhaps you'll be able to fetch a higher price that will make up for the time that you've invested in rendering the fine details. But if, on the other hand, you're a modest artist, and no matter how much time you and effort you put in, you'll never be able to get the level of detail that you get, for example, on the cloak of Ajax and of Achilles, then maybe, just maybe, the best thing for you to do is to try and get as good results as you can with minimal effort. So let's, with, uh, let's go into the details of these uh, painters and see what I mean by shorthand and minimal skill and effort. We're going to start with the Princeton painter and we'll move on to the swing painter. We won't discuss the painter of Berlin 1686, so it will just be the Princeton painter. This so let's look at the Princeton painter first. This is a beautiful vase, and the reason I show it is to give you an idea of what the Princeton painter is actually capable of doing. Um, yeah, this is, a, this is a really nice vase. We can see that he understands how you use three-dimensional, how you get three-dimensional effects um, to give a sense of volume. He's not really good at it, but you can see he's tried to show the volume on the, um, um, the what we call a hematium. Um, it's like a mantle, like a robe, I'll call, call it. But if you look at the, the figure, um, on the left, on you know, take the image on the right, which is the whole vase. Look at the figure on the left, the, the second to last figure on the left, um, the one who has his hand up like that. Um, look how the robe hugs the outline of the musculature of the figure. It gives it a, a sense of, of volume. So you can see that the Princeton painter is aware of these techniques. He's not a master, but he is aware of how you can create a little bit of volume. Um, there is some detail. We'll look at the locks on um, the forehead of the figure in the middle and on the left, in the image, images in the middle and on the left, sorry. Um, so it, it, there's beautiful use of color and um, yeah, there, there, there is some fine incision work. Look at the, um, the work on the collar, for example. Um, so, you know, there, there is a little bit of detail, certainly no exequias, but this is not a bad vase by any means. But not all of his work is like that. We have something a little bit plainer. If you look at the, um, the top right, I've shown an image of the head of Apollo, and that is the person 
in the middle playing his, the musical instrument is playing incidentally, is a kithara, uh, not a lyre. Um, you don't have to worry about the technical difference between a lyre and a kithara. A, lyre, a kithara has a big sounding board. Um, so you see him playing the kithara. Now let's uh, focus in on his head. And you can see that he's not really bothered with any incised details here. The effect is quite okay, but there's not much detail. Um, he's instead used some shorthand, just little little um, circles or circlets to, to indicate the hair at the forehead. Um, the mouth is indicated by a single line, single dash, and the moustache by two arcs. Very, very simple, very, very plain. But you can tell that it's a human, and actually the effect is not displeasing. He's made up for the lack of incised detail with a lot of colour, a lot of contrast. So the, 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 the actual result is, is actually fairly acceptable, but he, he hasn't put a lot of effort into it. Um, certainly nowhere near the amount of effort that's put into Exekius's example of um, uh, Exekius's painting of Achilles and Ajax playing dice. Um, now, I must say these two images are some of the better examples of a Princeton painter's work. I encourage you to just search for some of Princeton Painter's work on the internet and you'll see that some of it is, is a little bit more slapdash. But none of it is absolutely terrible. Let me compare briefly the Princeton Painter and the Swing Painter on the other hand. The Swing Painter may be one of the pupils of the, the Princeton Painter, possibly works closely with the Princeton Painter. Um, if you do a search for the string painter, you'll find there's a beautiful uh, word of interesting vase, rather than a beautiful vase, of um, a girl on a swing. And that's where he gets his name from. Many of his paintings are quite unusual. Uh, and so I would, I would, if I were you, do a search on the internet and look for some of the images of the swing painter. Of course, for copyright reasons, we can't show you a lot of them here. I wanted to really just say that the, the swing painter, apart from his unusual compositions, his faces are really done in a hurry, even compared with those of the Princeton painter. Beasley said of the swing painter that all his men look like geese. And I think that's, that's actually quite true. Can't put my finger on exactly why. Do you often find their heads leaning forward quite uh, uh, at quite an angle? Um, they're actually, after looking at, at a number of, of paintings by the swing painter, you'll soon begin to be able to recognise his paintings just from the way he renders the heads. But notice the shorthand. Notice how the image on the left by the Princeton painter has, even though the ear is not anatomically correct, he has tried to render a little bit of detail there. There's this sort of S shape that he's got. The, print, the swing painter, on the other hand, really, it's just it's just a little arc, half of, uh, and it's just a little arc, and I mean, there's really nothing to indicate any of the anatomical detail of the ear there. But you know, it's an ear, and that for him is enough. Um, notice the nostril is indicated by a little line, a little a little arc on the nose. Look at the Princeton painter's work on the right, and you can see that there's a little arc indicating the nostril. But look where that arc is on the swing painter's uh, head. It's not even in the correct place. It sort of looks as though he's got a scar down his nose rather than um, uh, uh, than a nostril. So it, it really he, he, it's really slapdash compared with the work of the Princeton painter. And yet both of them strive to do, you know, go for, for effect over technical detail. Looking at how slapdash the swing painter's work is, um, probably gives you some idea as to why he was able to produce so many vase paintings in his career. 
Um, now, let's go back to the Princeton painter briefly. And I, I would just like to uh, mention that when I showed you Lydus' work, the Horseman Amphora, and I asked you to compare it with um, Nearchus, um, a, a, a Horseman Amphora uh, by Nearchus, and I gave you the link because we can't show it for copyright reasons. There's also a Horseman Amphora by the Princeton painter, and I would like you to please go and have a look at that as well and compare it with Lydus's example because then you can get a flavor for what makes them different. But I would like you to bear in mind that the Horseman Amphora by the Princeton Painter, which um, with the link to which you've got in the slide, is considered by Beasley to be very fine by the Princeton Painter's standards. But I think, I think, you know, I think by comparing the Princeton Painter with these others, you'll get some a little bit more understanding of, of his style. And I think you can do the same kind of comparison with the swing painter as well. We have two images here, for example, one by the swing painter and another one by Exekius. The swing painter is on the left, obviously, um, and Exekius is on the right. It's one that you've seen as, uh, already. The slaying of Penthesilea by Achilles. I leave it as an exercise to you to compare these two, um, but a couple of things I think you can you can already see. Look at the rendering of the details in the face of the, um, the swing painter's uh, figures. Look at the writing. Exekius has this beautiful neat writing. The swing painter just has a row of blobs doesn't even bother to pretend that he knows how to write. But as I say, I'll, I'll leave that as an exercise to you. Please survey the work of the, Prince, of the Princeton painter and the swing painter, get a feel for who they are. But remember that I've dealt with them actually in quite a lot of detail in the previous um, video lecture on vase painting. So I urge you review that because I have already dealt with these two painters in quite a bit of detail. Next, we'll look at the Mannerists. I've already mentioned them before, but I just want to um, I just want to talk about them briefly on their own. So finally, I'd like us to look at the Mannerists, the black figure Mannerists. I've touched on them in relation to Amazis because some see the effector as perhaps a successor to the Amazis painter. Mannerists use exaggerated gestures and poses. Now we've taken the term Mannerist from the movement of art that came straight after the art of the Renaissance. Okay, so the later work by Michelangelo, for example, is considered Mannerist. And we've simply taken that term that refers to a lot of the art produced in Italy in the 16th century. And we have applied it to works of art from the 6th century BC. Okay. Now, while mannerism in the period just after the Renaissance is to some degree a conscious movement of art in which poses and musculature and um, uh, expressions are exaggerated. But it's not clear whether we can say the same about the mannerists of Athenian black figure. Okay, so we're using the term out of context in a way. Really, the mannerists, the black figure mannerists, or well, the, the mannerists in vase paintings, similar to the mannerists of the Renaissance, you know, two millennia later, use exaggerated, exaggerated gestures and poses. And that's really why we call them mannerists. But please don't think that 
the mannerists, the black figure mannerists are necessarily a specific art movement. We simply don't have enough biographical detail on any of those painters to know whether that's the case. What we do know is there are some painters who use these exaggerated gestures and poses, and they're from roughly about the same, the same time. There are two main painters here. There's the effector, whom, as I've mentioned before, is considered by some to be the Amazis painter's successor. And there's the elbows art painter. Now, the effector, he, the name effector simply means that his style is very affected. Small heads, very erect poses for the bodies. He likes to decorate ovoid amphorae, so very egg-shaped amphorae. And his gestures are quite exaggerated and angular, much like those of Amazis' later work. As for the Elbows Art Painter, you will understand the name by looking at the next slide. We've got two mannerists here. Um, you should remember these pictures because I used them to compare the work with the work of the Amazis Painter. On the left, the Elbows Art Painter and you can see his elbows are out. The el elbows of his running figures are out. He, his, his figures have um, the, these elbows which <laughs> go like that, almost like marionettes. They're <laughs> quite, quite, yeah, very exaggerated poses. Humans don't run like that. Um, and his work is recognizable for these exaggerated gestures. On the other hand, the image on the right is by the effector. Here we've got lovely upright uh, figures. Notice the shape of the amphora and how egg-shaped it is compared with the other amphora we, we may have seen. And I just want you to, to from, uh, um, think about and compare by in your own time the work of the effector with some of Amazis, the Amazis painter's later work. You can find lots of images on the internet. I keep saying this, but please do do some of your own uh, homework there. It'll be quite enriching. And yeah, you'll see lots of similarities, but you will, will also see lots of, of differences. I can point at just one for the moment. Look at how thin the legs of the effector's figures are compared with those of the Amazis painter. But that will be something for you to do. I just want to show you, uh, um, finally, another two images, the one by the effector on the right, and you can see the style, it's quite distinctive, it's very much in the same style as the image on the right from the previous slide. The image on the left is not by the Elbows Art Painter himself, but possibly, well it could be, but it just rather it's been attributed to the manner of the Elbows art painter, meaning that it, it, it could be by the Elbows art painter, but it could also be by somebody who's copying his style. Notice the angular uh, um, gestures here, but how exaggeratedly angular they are. Look at the size of the hands in relation to the size of the arms, for example. Um, very much Elbows art. Um, very much describes his his style. So anyway, that said, what I'd really like you to do is, um, if you want to get a feel for how attribution works, please don't simply limit yourself to the examples that I've shown you here. <clears throat> Go out and and use your eye, compare images, find images on the internet, particularly on the Beasley archive. But you can also go to the New York Mets uh, website where they've got lots of images. The Getty Museum has a lot of images. Um, Princeton's Art Museum has a lot of images. Uh, you'll find a, a lot of museums in the United States make their images available for you to look at. Not to use, but to look at. And so you can actually um, compare these images um, with each other. Um, the British Museum is another. So go out into these places, find examples by each of these painters, and in your own time, look at their styles and see if you can spot things which help you identify what is unique about each of these painters, at least by comparison with the other painters we've looked at. Okay, thank you very much.